And now it's time for Kids Talk. Time for Kids Talk, and she leaves the building. <laughs> Here I am. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Okay, I'm scanning for those of you who scowl at me and for those of you who smile at me. All right, I'm focusing right here. I got some smilers right there. That's good. Well, I am happy to be here with you all this morning. I have a little object lesson to do, and we don't have a lot of kiddos here this morning, but, but I have you. <laughs> And that's all I need is you guys. That's all I need. All right. So I'm going to talk to you this morning about wrapped up. Wrapped up is what we're going to talk about. So why don't we start with the scripture. Let's go to Romans 7. We're going to read quite a few verses. And I'm going to have to take the live stream out of my ear because that is so distracting to hear my voice like three seconds later. Romans 7, we're going to start at verse 18, and I'm going to read on and 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 on. So just be prepared. I see pages flipping. Romans 8, 7, or 7, 18 is where we're starting. Are we good? All right, Romans 7, I'm doing the wrong one, 7, 18. For I know that in me... That is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. I mean, this sounds like me. Verse 20 says, now, if I do that I would not, it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of, from the body of this death? And here's the answer. Who's going to deliver us from that? Thank I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with yeah. the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh of the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Did you guys hear that? There's no condemnation there. All this stuff about, man, I am really an awful person. Like, I want to do right, but then I don't. And my mind says, do right, but then my flesh says, do your own thing. And then in 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Moving on for verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteous of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit." For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Has anybody been looking for life and peace? All my hands are going up. Been looking for life and peace, and here are the answers. So I want to talk to you this morning about being wrapped up being wrapped up. Thanks, you may be seated. Being wrapped up. So have you ever received a gift, a gift from somebody and that gift was wrapped up in like one box and then another box and, or in a bag and then some stuffing on top of that, another box. You had to like dig through all these boxes. Yeah, that's kind of fun, right? And did you like it? Did you like having to dig through? Yeah, that's kind of fun, right? Being all wrapped up like that. Now, what kind of things in life can we get wrapped up in? 
work, your clothing, right? Maybe a good book or a good movie. What did you say? Bills. You can definitely get wrapped up in bills, right? I like to get wrapped up in a good book if I'm just sitting down to read and then like an hour goes by and I don't even realize it or a good movie or something like that. I can get wrapped up in good conversation when I'm hanging out with my friends like Aria, like hours go by and we're like, it's midnight. How did that happen? We get wrapped up in our conversations. So sometimes it's good thing, a good thing to get wrapped up in a hobby or something you love or things that are good for you. But when you do get wrapped up on something, usually it comes on quickly and you weren't prepared for it. It wasn't something you set out to do. You didn't set out to get wrapped up and completely engulfed in that situation, but you did. So when we're talking about getting wrapped up in sin, that's not going to be a really good thing. It's not like a hobby or a book or a conversation that you get wrapped up in, but it's the same concept. It just kind of happened all at once, and you didn't realize that you were getting wrapped up in that. So I'm going to need a volunteer to come up here and be my table, since I didn't bring my table. David, come on up. Your hand shot up first. And we're going to talk about being wrapped up. So stand over here, and I'll let you be my table, all right? So here we got So Hold your hands out. I've got a yellow paper first, right? And then underneath, what color paper is this? Blue. Blue, but look, something else is wrapped up in it. What do we have? A pink paper. A pink paper wrapped up in that one. So let's keep going. What do we have? Green. A green paper wrapped up in this one. And in the green is... Nothing. Nothing is in my middle green one. So if I'm using this as an object lesson, these, green, these papers, the green, the pink, the blue, and the yellow, these are sin. And I here am a very valuable, you can tell how valuable the bills are in my wallet, $20 bill. <laughs> I'm a very valuable $20 bill. This is my life right here. So if I fold up my life and I get wrapped up in a sin situation, usually sin doesn't just come in ones. What usually happens as soon as one sin happens in your life? All, the, of, the all of those. That's right. You get wrapped up in more. So kiddos, let's think about this. If you're home and you tell a lie to your mom and dad, um, I cleaned my room so I can go out and play. That's a lie, so we just wrapped, wrapped your life up right here and that one sin got wrapped up. But then what happens? Do your parents just say, oh, okay, go out and play? Usually they check it, because parents have been there, done that before. So the parents come and they look in your room and they're like, um, David, your room is not clean. You said your room was clean and it's not. And then what do we do? Do we just stay with the first lie, or do we try to fix it? Be like, oh, I'm sorry, okay, I'll clean my room. No, what do we do? Run, <laughs> run. run. <laughs> or we add another little lie on. Well, I clean most of it. Well, most of it is clean. Some is clean, like I put my clothes away. And you get a little attitude going. And then your mom, if she's wise, looks under your bed and is like, oh, you put your clothes away, did you? There they are, under your bed. And now another sin kind of gets wrapped up in here. And see, every time you do that, see how you're kind of turning your back on God? Every little time you add something to that situation. So that situation, here we go. And now my mom has said, oh, I see the clothes under the bed, and I wrap that up in something else, which is usually a little bit of sass. Well, it's not fair that I have to clean my room. It's so beautiful. All my friends are going out. How come I can't come out and I can clean my room later? You're so unfair, Mom. And now we've got sass that has turned our back on God, right? Another turning, another thing. And then maybe your friends text you or call you, where are you? We're outside playing softball. How come you're not out here? And then you wrap it up in another thing and be like, my mom is such a jerk. She won't let me do X, Y, Z. I can't come out because I have to clean my room. And I already cleaned it, but she's so perfectionist. I have to like dust and sweep and do all this stuff. And look what's happened. From one little piece of your life, that $20 bill that was valuable, that was good, that God had given you in your life, 
you just wrapped it up in sin, right? Wrapped it up, and that's not what we want. And that happens to us as adults. It happens to us definitely as teenagers. It doesn't just become little lies that we wrap up in, but it becomes one sin, one thing that we think we want to try out just to see how it is, and that leads to something else, and we just get completely wrapped up, completely wrapped up in our, in our sin. Can you hold those for me again as we unwrap? And then as we think we're having such a fabulous time with all this unwrapping, with all this doing all these things that we want to do and adding to our life, when we get back, to see what's happened to our life when we finally get down to the nitty gritty. I'm going to keep putting them right on. When we finally get back down and we go to take out the value of our life. Where is it? That $20, that value that God had put in your life, you destroyed it. It's gone. Your life is going to be empty. You think you have this cool thing in here, and you think all these things you added and wrapped up around it, added to it, it made it really cool, and you had this whole big, cool package of yellow. But when you get back down to it now, it's empty, and there's nothing there. And now what are you going to do? Now you've been living after what your head wanted to do, what your flesh wanted to do, and not after what the Spirit of the Lord, who gave you that value in the first place, had told you to do, and now you feel empty. So some people just wrap themselves right back up in all those choices that they should not be making, one after the other, trying to find something that's going to comfort them, flipping and turning their back from the Lord because... They don't want to do it God's way, but yet they're empty, so they're going to try another way, and just flipping and flipping, turning their back on the Lord, right back up, wrapping in, but then they feel stuck. Well, I can't open back up because inside it's empty. I've wrecked it. I have emptiness inside. I have no value inside. I've destroyed it. What do I do? And this is true. We see this in the Bible. Let me read you a couple scriptures here. Psalms 40, verse 12 through 13 says... For innumerable evils have cast me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. Innumerable iniquities, sin after sin after sin. They just keep coming, the next one, the next one, the next one. I can't even look up anymore because I'm just down. They are more than the hairs of mine head, therefore my heart faileth me. It's all over. I am stuck. I am empty. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Because we can't do it. The song we're going to sing, we can't do it. Only God can do it. What about Jeremiah 9, 3? And they bend their tongues like the bow for lies, but they are not valiant for truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. <laughs> If we're proceeding from evil to evil to evil and allowing ourselves to get wrapped up in one bad choice after the another because we just got in this mode of wrapping and turning and wrapping and turning from the Lord, then the Lord says, they don't know me. They don't know me. And if we feel like we're there all wrapped up and hopeless and empty inside with nowhere to go, we don't know the Lord. We don't know the Lord who can fix and the Lord who can mend and the Lord that can bring back what the canker worm stolen. But can we get to know him again? Can we spend that time with him? Yes. We surely can because we have a gracious God, a merciful God who is always there willing to restore if you just turn to him in repentance and say, oh, look what I've done. Look, look at this one. I wrapped this one up in this one. This one's terrible. Here, hold that one. Oh, my goodness. And then I wrapped it in this one, and this one was terrible, and this was a bad choice, Lord. Look at all this I've done. Here, Lord. That's a bad mistake. I took that crown away from you, didn't let you be God in that situation. And this one I purposefully did just because I wanted to, Lord. But now I really need to be turning my crown back over to you and doing what you want me to do. And this one, this was the one that started it all. The little, little tiny sin, the little tiny thing that I did that I thought would be fine. The little thought, the little thing that got stuck in my heart, the little attitude, the little lie, the little action. You guys, do you kids remember what SIN stands for? S-I-N? Stinky inside nastiness. 
stinky inside nastiness and it has a big I right in the middle of it, right? It's I, it's I made the choices and it's inside my heart. It's not necessarily outside, it's what's in my heart that makes me do it. And when we go to the Lord and we talk to him about that and say, Lord, I need to come back to you because you're the only one who can fix. You're the only one who can restore. What do we find? It's back. It is back because the Lord Jesus can restore value to your life. And David, do you see what's in there? Can you pull that off for me? What's in there? Tell everybody what that says. Jesus. The Lord Jesus, that's right. When we wrap our life around the Lord Jesus, when we put him first and we wrap and hold him close, make him the foundation, him the priority, yes. then we're not going to get wrapped up in the sins that are going to keep Thank us you. from him, that are going to end us up with empty, valueless life. If we keep him in our, as our foundation, then he will solve that for us. He will be our God. He will be our king. He will lead us in the way we can go. And we never have to be without that peace. We never have to be without that joy and that life because he will lead us. Even if we mess up, even if we start wrapping up, we can just unwrap and go to him and he will restore that. He's always there waiting for us. Thank you, David. I am so thankful for a God that we serve that loves us and that allows us to come back to him and allows us to give that crown back to him that we stole from him and tried to be our own king. And that he is there at any moment to welcome us back in and remind us that he loves us no matter what we've yes, done. So let's end this up by getting all of my young kids and my old kids up on their feet. Yes. And we are going to sing our Ephesians 3.20 verse that we are learning in Sunday School Kids, God Can Do. God can do it. I can't do it. But God can do it. He can do all of these things. He can close the lion's mouth. He can make the blind to see. He can raise the dead. He can calm the waters. He can do all of these things. God can do it way more than what we ask or think. Our minds are finite. We don't get it. We just see right here and now and are trying to fix stuff. But God can do it. God can share the lives, God can change the minds of kings. God can make a leopard dance and cause a blind to see. God can raise the dead and God can calm a raging sea. I can do it, God can do it. G-L-O-R-Y to God we can. It is good to be home. We came back from a brief stay in New Hampshire and getting back into the rut of normal life. And it's been convoluted and 
you know, the typical wear and tear getting into it. But it's not until coming into the house of God and worshiping does everything feel normal again. Gathered together with his people. The message I have this morning, uh, I was given on a write-up. I was really hoping for a couple days of just quiet and read some books. I managed to read the books, but the message came to me as a question. And the question was, why do you want a full glass? Now, that might seem very awkward. We were singing, and one of the songs was, I hunger and thirst for your righteousness. And the question that burdened me the entire trip was, why do you want a full glass? I have two texts this morning, so if you wouldn't mind standing, we're going to go into 1 Corinthians. I'm hoping the glasses have a pink tint to it. <laughs> well, this one looks clear and this one looks pink, so. But either way, I want to make sure I got plenty for when I need it. <laughs> so our first is going to be 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 through 16. And then we'll turn further into Corinthians for the second one. But the first one, starting in verse 12, is, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know things that are freely given to us of God. I want to point out that it was given for a purpose. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." And turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 21. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in a shambles, that eat, asking no questions for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Yes. Jumping down to verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Pastor, would you please pray a blessing upon his people? Amen. You may be seated. So Paul's letter to the Corinthians was for a def definite purpose. Duh. <laughs> Who writes a letter if there's not a purpose? But the specific purpose was, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. The Corinthian church had contentions, divisions, split of thought, 19 and 20 says, For it is written, I will...
Sorry, someone wrote my notes and they're horrible writing. <laughs> now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Right. See, there were some contentions about who was their authority. Who was teaching them? What was the right thing being taught? Men have, and I mean men in general, but all of humanity, has a general aptitude to try and find the easiest way possible to do everything. There's 10-minute abs, 9-minute abs, 8-minute abs, 7-minute abs, 6 minutes, and then just skip it all together and go to Burger King, buy one, get one free. It sounds great. What about children? They like the easiest way. I'll ask mom. If mom doesn't give me the answer I want, then I'll go see if dad will give me the answer. And hopefully dad's distracted enough that it's, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I can do. I learned early on the wisdom of it's okay with me if it's okay with your mother. That way, there's no conflict of what the direction is. Unfortunately, kids are smarter than that and take on the, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. If the opportunity is there, we'll take it. There is a phrase that I used at work when there was a circumstance, and there was a choice being offered for an individual. And everyone else goes, there's no way this person will take option B. There's just no way. It's too detrimental. And my response is, I think you're wrong. Because a drowning person will grab whatever's in their reach, even if it's a snake. And sure enough, option B was taken, and this individual was bitten by their choice. Because whatever harbor in a storm, whatever's easiest, whatever gets me out of trouble quickly. It didn't help that the church had taken on the culture of Corinth. That it wasn't a church standing out, but it was a church that had become among. And the philosophy of the Greeks was the sophists. Sophistication. And a lot of it wasn't to be correct, but to appear correct and sophisticated enough that no one challenges you. Unfortunately, it's still present today, isn't it? If you look the part and act the part, they'll believe whatever you give them for an answer, whether or not it's right or wrong. And that's why you find real teachers who say, go in and dig out truth for yourself. You don't take what is handed to you on a platter without thinking about it, without digging for yourself to make sure it is right, it is true, it is the correct thing for you. One of the things that was said of, I believe it's Protagoras, was of all things, the measure of men, or sorry, of all things, the measure is man. Of the things that are, that they are. Of things that are not, that they are not. Let me paraphrase in plain English. If I don't think it's the truth, it's not the truth. I dictate what's true. I dictate what's right. I dictate those things that are appropriate. It is my truth. I'm going to tell you my truth. I'd like to think that it stopped many years ago, that it's, oh, it's philosophy. That's, you know, in the past. It's not. I had teachers, I'm dating myself, 20 years ago that said there is no truth. Truth is what you make of it. Truth is what you can act sophisticated enough to make people believe you. 
And all that does is bring confusion, disorder, chaos. Because no one really will agree on anything. I know this because I have two girls that share a room, and it's painted two different colors. Two walls are purple, two walls are pink, because it was easier than fighting with them about a mutual color. <laughs> what happens, though, when everyone wants to paint everything in their own shade? Truth becomes irrelevant. Real truth becomes lost. Real truth stops mattering to those who declare their own. But the truth is always there. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't change. He is true. But the perception of man says, I haven't seen it. If God is there, how come this, that, or the other thing? How come, how come, how come any objection to what is really true? Because if something is wrong, then it has to be fixed. Right? If you have a flat tire and your car's pulling to the side, you got to fix it. Otherwise, it's no longer a working car. Society says, just rename it as a tricycle and keep going. You'll get to your destination. Do we choose to redefine or do we choose to correct? Do we really look for truth or do we look for a shade that fits us? Do we find a Christianity that's just strict enough that I don't have to change my thinking, that I don't have to change my obedience? Well, I'm not of Paul. I'm of this person. Because it's, you know, I know it's not quite the truth, but it's close enough to the shade of truth that if I hold it up, you can barely see the pink in the glass. Yeah, but it's supposed to be crystal clear. Yeah, but this is good enough. That truth is good enough. You're right. It is good enough for damnation. It is good enough to be idolatry. It is good enough to be witchcraft. It is good enough for you not to be a part of the body. The body works together when all things work for the common and correct truths. And Christ is the head of the body. If the body says, well, no, I'm just going to do my own thing, it's no longer a part of the body. When the white blood cells decide, I don't want to just take care of bad things, I want to start attacking good things, because, yeah, I know they're good things, but I, I don't really like it. It's not really my cup of tea. You end up with leukemias, where your white blood cells want to attack everything that's good. You end up with arthritic conditions that hinder the body. Not just that white blood cell anymore, but it has an impact upon the entire body that it no longer function, functions as it should. But it's close enough, right? Well, our doctors will tell it's close enough. Oh, you got arthritis? Take some Advil. It just it happens with age. Things break down. <laughs> Not with our God, it doesn't. See, because he sustains. He is perfection. He doesn't change. His expectations don't change because society changes. His expectations don't change because we don't want to see what he's trying to show us. We are responsible to see it. His truth. In 2 Corinthians 12, it talks about that Division in us. Our mind versus his mind. 
our flesh versus his spirit. And that he has given it, his spirit to us, that we might know the things that are freely given. Amen. That we might know him. That we might know his truth in revelation that has been freely given. Redemption that has been freely given. The things that he has freely shown. But if we don't have his mind in us, close enough is good enough. Which things also we speak, not in man's wisdom. There's no way we can describe him. There's no way we can approach him. There's no way we could ever know him unless he first has revealed himself to us. And it is his spirit active in us that teacheth. Not a one-time thing, but a continual submission to his teaching. To see things as he wants us to see them. But our natural man cannot receive it. Neither can we know them, because they are spiritually discerned. It says, but he that is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is judged for not. The all things. So I want you to keep in mind. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I read that a couple ways. Is... Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who can approach to that? Who can approach God? We can't. And further it says that he may instruct them. One, and I know this is me, my thoughts, is are we like Job thinking we can instruct God? Do we think our ways are right? that our ways are true, that we can instruct God of what is appropriate and what is not? Well, God, let me tell you about the truth as I see it. I'm good, thanks. Let this mind be in you. You see things from my point of view. You see my authority. You submit to my authority. And I will guide you. First Corinthians eight six. Says, But to us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things. And we in him, in one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. And in verse 23 of chapter 10, we we read, all things are lawful for me. Why are all things lawful for me? Because if his mind is in me, if I am using his spirit to discern, if the Holy Ghost is teaching me, then all things are lawful because all things are under him and by him and for him. But all things are not expedient. Not everything that's lawful for us gets us to where we got to go. I also enjoy a good book. Love it. I say I got three done While on vacation, I think that's three more than in the previous year. (laughs) But what if that takes over my life? What if I'm reading things that are contrary to his word? What if I'm reading things that don't help me know him better? I'm not saying Star Trek is going to help me know him better. Because sometimes, you know, you just want to read a good sci-fi book. 
But the fact is, is all things doesn't help us along the path. It doesn't expedite, make it faster, make things go. Those things we need to leave behind because if they're stopping us, if they're preventing us from moving forward, we don't need them. Might be lawful, but we don't need it. Also says, all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Not everything is acceptable for building. Don't believe me? Go to Home Depot and find out wherever they get those two-by-fours from because they are not straight. They are nothing I want to build with. I think if you string one of them up, you could probably make a bow and arrow without having to do any wood bending. That's, it's not good material. I don't want to build with that. I don't want it part of my structure. And the things that might be lawful, I don't want them part of my life because they are not going to get me to the structure that I need. They're not going to have me build upon the foundation as I should. In 1 Corinthians 6.12, it also says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. It's very easy for things to try and take over, isn't it? I'll give you a good example. Money. Money's that's how we purchase things, isn't it? Anybody eating today? Unless you grew up from a garden, at some point there is a commerce exchange involving money. Having money is not bad. But when money becomes your driving factor and the most important thing to you, you're now under its control. And you no longer have your liberty. You have allowed the things to take over and have an improper place. just in case. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. And it says wealth there, and wealth is in italics. But why do we have that liberty? Is it to establish our own kingdoms? If we use the analogy of the body, if you are a cell, is it for your own purpose or is it to edify the body? We want to fulfill our purpose. A cell that doesn't fulfill its purpose isn't always benign. At best, the things that we find are benign. Most of the time when things are no longer fulfilling its purpose, they're cancers, they're problems, they're tumors, they're prohibitive. They drain the energy that the rest of the body needs to survive. Individual kingdoms are not wanted. Our liberty is not to build up our own. It says, for the earth is the Lord's. Not ours, the Lord's. And further, and the fullness thereof. All things belong to him. And if we are in right relationship with his authority, we can discern what all things are appropriate for us. Our liberty is the ability to have right relationship with his creation and with him. To demonstrate his lordship in our lives, not our own. It says, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit. It's a good start. 
but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So how does any of this answer the question, why do I want a full glass? And I had quite a few answers, but none of them were right. Well, it's just in case, because I got this. In case I get worn down enough, Lord, I know that I got a spare glass here. So that if I feel worn down, I know I can turn and I got a backup cup here. So whenever I'm feeling not worthy enough, I can just praise you a little bit and... mm. Glad I got that full glass. I want to make sure I fill it back up so that I have my emergency reserves. You know what? It's not the right answer. But Lord, I only, I only need it on you know, Monday, Tuesday. I can make it through most of Wednesday to service. I have a reserve here. That's not a good reason to have a cup. Well, Lord, ain't I supposed to have a full cup? Shouldn't, shouldn't I have a full cup at all times? Shouldn't I always have you ready on hand? Not just emergencies, but I always should be ready with a full cup on my person to demonstrate your lordship in my life? That wasn't the answer either. And I knew these were horrible answers. <laughs> and, and I knew the conclusion of it was going to be, well, tell me. But there's something about the path of least resistance where if I pretend to think about it for a day or two and throw out an answer, maybe I'd throw them off my trail. <laughs> Well, how about I just want to have a full glass? When I go to the restaurant and ask for a cup of water, I just say, very thirsty, keep it coming. Lord, I just want a full cup. Isn't that enough? I just want it. No spiritual side about it. But this full cup that I carry around shows that I'm doing what I'm supposed to. Look at my privilege as a child of God. I have a full cup. You know what? That wasn't right either. (laughs) Oh, Lord, it's not an emergency reserve. It's not I just want it. Having the glass isn't just, well, I've made it. Well, then, Lord, why do I want a full glass? Because it's the start of what we're supposed to be doing. We should be sipping from that cup continually. But more than a cup, we should be offering it to anybody else who needs that water. Lord, give me the cup so that I can be sustained and provide water to anyone else who doesn't. Anyone else who is thirsty. Give me that full glass if that's what you want me to have to edify the body. This isn't just my cup. It's so that I can maintain proper place in the body, so that I am a healthy member of it. But more so than that, 
is so that I can be a healthy member for those around me, so that the body of Christ might be edified, that it works smoothly, so that more is added to his kingdom. It is not a trophy because it's nothing I have done or deserved or should have, other than he said, thirst after me. If I try and wear it as a badge of honor, how foolish to think that I've done anything worthy of it. How foolish to think it's a canteen where he will ever run out. Foolish to think that I would ever be far enough from him that he couldn't reach out and fill my cup whenever it was needed. That instead of having it give me life continually, that I wanted to fill it with my own separate reserve of my thinking instead of what he wants from me. Instead of being a continual partaker, do it whenever I feel it's absolutely necessary. And the part that struck home the most to me is who else are you sharing it with? What good is it to have his mind and his understanding and his teaching to be overflowing with his mercy and hoard it for myself? This is my water. This is why I want a full glass. Are we examining why We seek him. Very easy to think that it's the pinnacle of spirituality to say, well, I just serve him because he is God. And not realize we're missing the whole aspect of his love. That we're so busy making sure that our kingdom is fortified and strengthened, and secured that we're no longer adding to His. That we're walking around with potential that is never used. I know it's not a typical conclusion, but And I end with the thought is, why do you want a full cup? Praise the Lord. I think that's a timely call for us to examine ourselves. I'm not going to re-preach. So why don't we take a moment and let's go before the Lord. I feel as though he's spoken to us today. Let's take a minute to respond to his call. Lord, we thank you for 
speaking to us this morning. We thank you for your ongoing call to us. Lord, we want you to be that overflowing fountain within us that would flow through us into our community and to those around us. Not for what you bring, but so that it might bring glory to you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.